Christ's glory will be seen in the millennial reign when we reign with Him for a thousand years upon this earth and we will manifest the glory of our Savior to that world. There are three things in the book of Ephesians that God wants us to understand. Number one, He wants us to know what is the hope of His calling. We are called to manifest His glory. And that's the hope that we will see Him one day face to face. Face to face we will see our Lord. And we read in verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 1 that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling. His calling refers to His divine election and His foreknowledge and predestination of a people for His name. And our purpose in divine election is that we be like Him. We are to be conformed to the image of His Son. That means that someday we will completely and totally be like Jesus. Now we're not 100% like Him now, but someday we will be. It's called maturation. It's called growth in grace. It's called perfection. Someday our perfection will be complete in us. It's working in us now. But it's not complete yet. As J. Vernon McGee used to say on his radio program, don't criticize me. God's not through with me yet. <laughs> and that's true. He's working in us daily, conforming us to the image of His Son. He wants us to be just like His Son. And we will be someday. But it waits until we come into His presence. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep growing in grace, becoming more like Jesus day by day. We do that now. And that's what we're in training for. The reason you're here, the reason God has to take you home to glory is because you're still in training. You're being trained to reign in glory. And you're not ready yet. He's got more work to do in you before you're ready to reign with Him in glory. And you're in training right now. And this will explain some of the troubles and trials that come our way. God allows them because they're training for us. He's training us as kings to reign with Him on this earth. To understand, secondly, He wants us to know that His glory is to see His own reflection in us. Now I expect that this morning you stood before a mirror. That mirror is not you. That mirror was a reflection of you. You saw your face in the mirror. He wants to see your face mirrored to the world. He wants His reflection to be seen in you. He wants you to be like Jesus. Verse 18 of, first of Ephesians chapter 1 says, And what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. He has an inheritance in us, and we are His inheritance. It's a double inheritance. Some believe that it means the saints are His inheritance. The third thing He wants us to understand is God's power exhibited when He raised Christ from the dead. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His mighty power which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in heavenly places. Peter picks up the refrain and adds to it, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living or lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then referring, I believe, to the reign of Christ upon this earth when Jesus comes back. 1 Peter 1, 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Those three things God wants us to understand. Now we go to verse 3, the believer's trials. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. A lady went to her pastor one day and said, Pastor, pray for me to have patience. He said, all right. And he got down and began to pray, Lord, send trials upon this woman. Send trouble her way. Send pain and anguish her way. She said, oh, Pastor, stop, stop. I don't want you to pray for that. I want you to pray for patience. He said, tribulation worketh patience. That's why we go through tribulation. It produces patience in us. We're in, we're in training. And sometimes we get stubborn. And when we do, God sends tribulation. It produces patience. And patience is greatly to be desired. We read, and patience experience, and experience hope. If children, verse 17, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Isaiah 48, 10. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. In the furnace of affliction. He sends trials to train us. 2 Corinthians 12. And he said unto me, this is Paul speaking, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly therefore will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now we do not glory in the afflictions themselves, but we glory in what caused the afflictions. It is God who caused the afflictions. We know that all things work together for good to them who love God and who are the called according to His purpose. Therefore, 2 Timothy 2.10, I endure all things for the elect's sake that I may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. 2 Corinthians 4.17 For our light affliction is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He's telling us that the afflictions we suffer in this life works for us a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So we welcome the tribulations because we know He sends them. He controls them. He knows just exactly how much tribulation we need. And He takes it away when He's pleasurable to do so. So Paul said, Therefore I take fervent pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God uses the weak things of this world to confound the things that are mighty. So we glory, not only in this present life, but we glory in the future. Then also, in verse 4 of our chapter, we see the believer's growth. That growth comes through tribulation, and patience experience, and experience hope. We have hope through tribulation. That's the reason God sent tribulation to you, to build hope in us. We glory in tribulation because it gives us hope. And then in verse 5, we see the believer's helper. That's the Holy Spirit. 
And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. God's love to us is manifested to us. Then in verse 6, the believer's Savior, by the way, the Holy Spirit lives in every believer. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and He will lead you and guide you, and He will fulfill this growth and maturation in your life. As you yield to the Holy Spirit, He will lead you, and He will cause you to grow. And then verse 6, the believer's Savior. For when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die for good people. There aren't any good people. He died for the ungodly. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He died for the ungodly. That gives me hope. I was a sinner. He saved me as a sinner. I came to Him as a sinner. I was ungodly. That means not like God. I didn't want God. I didn't want to hear about God. But one night He saved me. And then I want to know all I can know about Him. I was ungodly. Now I believe I'm godly. I want to be like Him. I want to serve Him. I want to know Him more and more. I am godly now. But He died for the ungodly. And if you come to Him, you have to come as one of the ungodly. Many people try to come to Him and fail because they don't come ungodly. You need to come to Him, Lord, I'm the sinner for whom Jesus died. I'm that sinner. Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. You see, when a person is truly saved, he will see the depravity of his own nature. And knowing that he cannot change it, he will come to Jesus as an ungodly sinner and Jesus will save him on that basis who gave Himself a ransom for all to be testified in due times. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Then verse 7 and 8, the believer's benefactor. For scarcely, would a righteous, uh, for, scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet pure adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die, but God commandeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He's our benefactor. Our benefit is salvation. And it comes through Jesus. But God commended His love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Then in verse 9, we have the believer's deliverance. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. This is a present hope that we have. There's a great tribulation period coming upon the earth when the earth will be soaked with blood and earthquakes and floods and terror and death. But we have deliverance from that, I believe. Verse 9. Saved from wrath. The divine wrath of God is going to fall upon this earth. It's called the tribulation period of the book of Revelation. And we have been saved from that wrath through Him. We have been, present tense, saved from wrath. Revelation 6.16 the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? That word wrath is the Greek word orge. And it means an anger that builds and builds and builds. God's anger at the world of its sin is building and building day by day. 
And one of these days, the tribulation period will break upon this earth and the wrath of God will fall upon the unsaved. We're delivered from the wrath, I believe. And that's what the Bible says. I believe that wrath is the tribulation wrath. It could mean the wrath of God against our sins, but God has taken away our sins, and so it must be the wrath of the tribulation period. Then in verse 10, the believer's reconciliation. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. We are in legal union with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are one with Him. We are united to Him. He that believeth on the Lord is one spirit. Then we have the believer's assurance. His eternal life is in us. That's in verse 10 and in verse 11. We have the believer's joy. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Verse 12, the believer's federal head. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That means all sinned in Adam. And when Adam sinned, he plunged the human race into a state of spiritual death. We all died in Adam. We became depraved and lost in Adam. But there is a second Adam. Jesus is the last Adam. And there's a federal headship. We are under, not Adam, when we're saved, we're under Christ. He's the head of the church. We are under Christ. And that's the believer's federal headship.